Hey, welcome to my channel. In this video, I'll be discussing the differences between conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin and the importance for diagnosis. So if you end up learning at least one thing, then hit the like button and subscribe for more. Let's begin. It all starts with our red blood cells. If you look inside a red blood cell, you'll find a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is composed of globular proteins, which is a fancy way of saying spherical protein chains. These proteins are named alpha and beta. Hemoglobin also has something known as heme. Heme is a ring-shaped molecule with an iron atom attached, and it serves as the binding site for oxygen that we breathe in. In normal circumstances, the red blood cells are broken down after 120 days. Degradation begins inside the macrophages of the spleen, which removes old and damaged red blood cells from the circulation. During this breakdown of the red blood cells, there is also a breakdown of hemoglobin and heme. The breakdown of heme leads to biliverdin, I love that name, <laughs> which is then reduced to bilirubin. Now this bilirubin is insoluble in blood, also known as unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. Because it's insoluble in the blood, in order for it to move through the circulation, it must be bound to albumin. It would then go to the liver. The liver will make it water soluble so that it can be eliminated properly. The liver will accomplish this by adding to it glucuronic acid aided by the enzyme uridin glucuronyl transferase. This will make the bilirubin more polar and water soluble. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we call conjugated bilirubin. This conjugated bilirubin is added to the bile that is released into the small intestines during digestion of food. Within the intestines, the conjugated bilirubin is converted to urobilinogen by intestinal bacteria. Three main things happen to this urobilinogen. So about 80% is reduced to stercobilinogen, which is then oxidized into stercobilin and then excreted through the feces. Stercobilin is what gives feces that brownish color. About 18% is reabsorbed back into the portal circulation and transferred back into the liver where the urobilinogen is converted into conjugated bilirubin and then the cycle repeats. About 2% of the urobilinogen enters the systemic circulation and is filtered in the kidney. It gets oxidized into urobilin, and that is what gives the urine its characteristic color. Bilirubin tests are utilized to diagnose diseases related to the liver, bile duct, and red blood cells. Because we have two versions of the bilirubin, conjugated versus unconjugated, it makes diagnosis easier. When a blood test is done, we can check the total bilirubin level, which is a combination of both, or we can get the individual levels of unconjugated bilirubin and the conjugated bilirubin, and that will be the focus here. Let's focus on elevated bilirubin since low levels of bilirubin is not usually a clinical concern. Elevated bilirubin leads to jaundice or yellow discoloration of the skin and eyes. When the unconjugated bilirubin is elevated, it may be due to hemolytic anemia where there is an accelerated breakdown of red blood cells. In a separate video, we will discuss this in detail, but for now, just know that this can be because of defects in the red blood cells or enzyme deficiencies. Rifampin impairs the hepatic uptake of bilirubin into the hepatocytes, so it can't be conjugated. Chronic heart failure tends to decrease hepatic blood flow, so the unconjugated bilirubin doesn't reach the liver for it to get conjugated. Lastly, Gilbert syndrome, which results in a deficiency in the uridine glucuronyl transferase, the enzyme responsible for the conjugation of the bilirubin. So therefore, we will have more unconjugated bilirubin just circulating. Elevated conjugated bilirubin may be due to obstruction of the biliary flow into the intestines, which will lead to accumulation of conjugated bilirubin within the hepatocytes. This is also known as extrahepatic cholestasis, and it's important to distinguish this from intrahepatic cholestasis that can also occur, which prevents the conjugated bilirubin from being moved into the bile. This is seen in Dubin-Johnson syndrome. Lastly, when there's hepatocellular injury and the liver can't make bile, it will cause an elevation of the conjugated bilirubin in the blood because the bile is not there for it to be get released into. And that will be all, folks. I hope I was able to cover the main points in a short period of time. 
If you learn at least one thing from this video, then make sure it's a like, subscribe, and leave a comment as needed. Also, follow me on these social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video, and take care.